Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to a new week. Uh, hope you had a great weekend. Uh, let's begin this time with a word of prayer. Uh, so any one of us can please lead in prayer. Prabhakar, if you're there, can you please lead us in prayer? Let's pray. Right. Do I have any further? Thank you for this gift of life that you've given us. Father, we pray for a guidance and blessing. I commit our teacher, Pastor Paul, into your, into your hands. Whatever is going to teach us, let it be of good use and benefit us as a family. I commit everybody who has not joined. And I pray for even for the internet, everything will be in order. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Kennedy. All right. So uh, we'll continue from where we stopped. We stopped at uh, last week. We looked at chapter seven and chapter eight. The chapter eight was interesting, right? He, the apostle Paul talks about food sacrifice to idols. And so he, he, he brings that whole chapter to a close saying, yes, there is freedom for us as believers uh, because we know that there's only one God. We know that uh, God is all powerful and an idol means nothing. Yet, for the sake of my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, who are probably not as mature as the others, uh, I don't want to come to a place where because of me eating food sacrificed to idols, that this fellow believer, uh, is, his faith is questioned and he decides, he or she decides to, uh, you know, abandon the whole faith. And so Paul, the apostle is saying, what is more important for me is not the food. What is priority is not that I have freedom and I can do what I want just because I know and I have knowledge about things. But he uses that wonderful verse. He says, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. Right? So he brings that whole chapter to a close. He's saying, if it is something that will bring uh, a doubt or fear or bring another believer uh, to question the faith, I would not partake of it. Right, And again, uh, in chapter 10, he talks about food sacrifice to idols. Uh, so from chapter 8, let's move to chapter 9. Right, In chapter 9, the Apostle Paul is... Uh, you know, what happens is the believers start to question his authority, right? Uh, in a sense, they, uh, the previous, probably the previous letter they asked, uh, they ask Apostle Paul, you know, uh, why, why, is, why must we listen to all of this, right? Why do we have to go through all these, you know, rules and regulations and all of these things? And maybe some of them questioned Apostle Paul in the sense that, uh, why should we listen to him? Right? We have our own church. We have our own leaders. Uh, you know, maybe some of them in the church in Corinth haven't even met the Apostle Paul because after he moved on from Corinth, maybe there were many believers who came into the church, so they don't know who Apostle Paul is. They must have heard of him. Uh, and so here in chapter nine, the Apostle Paul is defending his apostleship and. As an apostle, he mentions that I have certain rights and certain responsibilities and how I did not use those rights and responsibilities to my own benefit, right? So he brings this chapter, he, he brings this another uh, problem or this another uh, situation in the church in Corinth and he addresses uh, this matter, right? So let's go into chapter uh, nine, I'm sure all of us know this, the, the word apostle means, uh, the Greek is apostolos, which means a sent one, right? Now, we must understand this before we get into uh, the chapter. There are three kinds of apostles, right? Three categories of apostles, right? Now, if you look in the book of Revelations, there are the 12 apostles of the Lamb, right? Now, nobody can add to that 12 apostles. They are the 12. Right, then you got the second uh, criteria, which are founding apostles. Right, these are apostles who 
you know, who are instrumental in bringing revelation, who are able to start churches, able to start ministries, build ministries. So if you look at it, the Apostle Paul was one of these founding apostles, right? And also, if you look at uh, Peter and James, these are apostles who were able to start new work and really lead the people, um, the congregation or the believers into Christ likeness, right? So the first category is the 12 apostles and revelations. No, there's going to be only 12. Nobody can add to that. Then are the founding apostles, right? Like the great apostle Paul, Peter, and James, who later on in Acts 15 became the leader of the church in Jerusalem, right? And the third category is the ministry gift of the apostle. Right now, these are those who we call right now, who are, you know, going out, planting ministries, pioneering ministries, advancing the church today. Right now, it's interesting here when you look at the Apostle Paul. He, when he begins his defense of his apostleship, he does not count, uh, you know, point to his personal encounter. He doesn't say, "Hey, you know what? I was studied in Ju uh, or Judaism, studied under Gamaliel, and I was commander of the temple guard. I did this. I did that." He does not mention any of that, right? He uh, does not mention, you know, I was going to Damascus and I saw the Lord Jesus. Right now, he does not mention it, right? He does not mention the revelations that he received, right? Uh, later on, uh, I think it's in the same book. Uh, yes, in was it was eleven. Uh, he says, "What I received from the Lord, I gave unto you." The night the Lord was Jesus was betrayed, and so it was all received through revelation. And he also talks about, you know, going up to the third heavens, right? So his personal revelations, or he does not talk about his missionary journeys, the churches that he planted. The epistles that he's written, and you know, he does not do all that. What does he point to in, in terms of his right as, as an apostle? He says, I am a servant of the Lord, and that is the first defense of his apostleship. That right? he says, I'm a servant of the Lord. So all these other criteria personal encounters, personal revelations, the letters I've written, the churches I've planted, you know, the people who listen to me, uh, you know, all these things are secondary. But first, defense, he says, I am a servant of the Lord. Right? And what does he point to? He points to the fruit of his ministry. And I love what Jesus says. He says, you shall be known by your fruit. And so Paul is pointing out, he's saying, listen, the reason I am saying this is because as an apostle, you are my work in the ministry. Now, it's also interesting. You see that Paul does not boast about what he has done. Right? He points to the fruit of his ministry, but he's talking about his sacrifice, his stewardship, the challenges, the self-discipline, the the trials, the tribulations that he went through, right? He, he does not say, hey, uh, church in Corinth, you know what? I went in the first missionary journey before coming here. Go into Galatia, and you see the number of churches I've planted there, so many believers there, you know, so many people who have accepted the Lord, and that is, that's why I'm an apostle, right? He does not say that. Uh, you, you see the humility in his defense. Right, uh, and and he's saying, see, first thing is, I'm a servant of Christ, and the fruit of what I have done is seen. If there is no fruit, then I have no authority to speak over your life. Right. So, even as we go through this chapter, we must keep our hearts open to understand that ministry is really about serving the Lord Jesus. It's not a place to boast. It's not a place where we can uh, take credit for ourselves. It's really serving the Lord. And, and that's where you, we will see the fruit of the ministry. Why did Apostle Paul see such a wonderful fruit in his ministry? Because he said, hey, uh, uh, I'm branded in Christ. I, I, 
I'm no longer myself. I am I'm crucified with Christ. So it's not my will. Whatever I do, it's not about me. Right? He uh, later on he goes on to say, uh, "If I live, I'm going to serve the Lord. If I die, I'll go and be with the Lord." But I do feel like dying and going and being with the Lord because it's so much more better. But for the sake of the church, I am here and I will continue to serve the Lord. So there was no way of any boasting there. Right? So we know the Apostle Paul was uh, uh, an established apostle. But let's see in chapter 9, how does he begin to defend his apostleship? Right, so we'll read a couple of verses and then we'll get in. Let's read uh, chapter 9, verse 1 to 15, uh, but we'll just break it down. Excuse me. Okay. Sorry, yeah. So am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? And are you not my work in the Lord? Right? This is interesting, right? Are you not my work in the Lord? If I am an apostle to others, yes, doubtless I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. Right? And he's he's talking to the church, right? He's saying, You are the seal of my apostleship. My defense to those who examine me in this. Do we have no right to eat and drink? Do we have no right to take along a believing wife, as do also the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only uh, Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? Now, it's interesting. You see, Paul is adding Barnabas. If you see in the first missionary journey, what happens? Right, They finish their first missionary journey. Uh, Paul and Barnabas have a sharp disagreement, and they part ways but here in the second missionary journey uh, he's he's finished he's somewhere in the middle of that journey and he's writing and he's saying he remembers Barnabas and he's saying is it only Barnabas and I who have no right uh, you know to refrain from working right because he knows that even Barnabas worked with his hands and provided for himself right so whoever goes to war at whoever goes to war at his own expense, who plants a vineyard and does not eat its fruit, or who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock. Now he's saying this because he's saying, now uh, you know, I have all of this. I can ask for all of this, right? I can ask for vineyards. I can ask for the to eat the fruit of my own labor. I can ask, uh, you know, for the uh, you know, for example, you know he, what he's trying to say here is, if I have cattle, can I not drink from my own drink the milk from my own cattle? I can, right? Uh, nobody can question that, right? So he's trying to say, this work that I'm doing, I'm I have a right to ask for things because you're my seal, right? You're the work in the ministry. But I don't ask for it. And he goes on, verse 8. Do I say these things as a mere man, or does not the law say the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads on the grain. Is it the oxen God is concerned about? Or does he say it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, that it is written that he who plows should Plow in hope, and he who threshes in hope should be partakers of his hope. You know, verse 9 is very interesting. What does he say? Do not muzzle an ox while it treads on the grain. The word muzzle means to, you know, uh, to cover the ox. You know, you, you put a covering on the on the mouth. Now imagine you got, for example, a huge one acre of land, and you have a plantation there. Right, and you're you know you're trying to build some crops, and along the way the crops grow. Now, the ox is doing all the hard work, right? So it's okay if the ox eats a little bit of its grain, right? Some of the plants that pop up, uh, or some of the leaves. It's okay. Is it wrong for the ox? It's not, right? So if an owner look, uh, if I'm an owner of an ox. I'll say, okay, 
poor ox it's doing so much for me one acre of land uh, let it eat because that needs strength so that you know i can continue the work on the fields but if i muzzle that ox if i cover its mouth in a way that it can't eat anything what's going to happen it will show that i am a you know rude uh, owner of the ox i don't care about the ox and two it will also show that you know um, i'm being very un not emotional not i'm not caring for the ox i'm just looking at how do i gain more money how do i gain more you know just because that little the ox can eat and it's a powerful verse right how can i muzzle an ox while it's treading the grain because the ox is doing everything right verse 11 if we have spiritual things for you it is a great thing if we reap your material things if others are partakers of this right over you are we are we not even more nevertheless we have not used this right but endure all things lest we hinder the gospel of christ do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the temple and those who serve at the altar partake in the offerings of the altar even so the lord had commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel but i have used none of these things nor have i written these things that it should be done so to me for it would be better for me to die than any one should make my boasting void these are strong words right was 14 he says uh was 13 onwards he says you know uh, he's bringing out the old testament he's saying the old testament when when you bring in your offerings and you offer it to uh, uh, you know you make your offerings a peace offering guilt offering sin offering whatever offering you make the priest has a right or the portion of that offering now when we have the right to it that person the priest can either have it or not have it right and and here he's saying how much more we who have done this work we have a right but we don't use that right, right? we don't use our our you know uh, uh, the things that we have done our apostleship for our own personal gain right because i don't want paul is saying we don't want our boasting of being an apostle of of being an, uh, an apostle to become empty should never come to a place where somebody else says hey he's he's become a you know preacher or an apostle so that he gets these benefits he paul is saying if that's the reason our boasting is empty it's void right so these are strong words now look at what paul points out as he defends apostleship he says you are my work and the seal of my apostleship right so it's not like i'm somebody who just came shared the gospel and went away and you know nothing happened look at my fruit look at the fruit of the ministry right there are lives changed there are churches planted you are my fruit of my apostleship right and two he says i have not abused the power of being an apostle now remember in the early church right uh, in jerusalem there were people who wanted to come into you know full time ministry or join so that they get fame or uh, you know they become powerful or they become wealthy right there were different wrong reasons why people wanted to get into ministry so paul is defending saying i'm not coming to ministry for any uh, fame or any uh, you know benefit or any freedom or any you know comfortable life right he he gives three points there he says as an apostle i have certain rights and what are those rights here he says to have a believing wife yet he chose not to have a believing wife right why previously he he talked about how all this you know of being single and the gift of singleness and being married we talked about that so he says if i wanted i could have got married had children but that's going to take a lot of my time but i chose not to so that i can serve you i can do the ministry too he says 
I, I could have said, okay, since I'm in full-time ministry, I don't have to work. You all provide for me. But he doesn't do that. All through, even in the final missionary journey, he goes into Rome. He's staying in that rented house. What is he doing? It says there that he worked with his own hands and provided for himself. Yes? I think it's in the book of Acts. Uh, we'll look at it later. Uh, but it, this was in Rome where he spent you know, most of his time. Yeah, the last chapter of Acts. So let me read that so that we understand. Acts 28 and verse 30. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to him. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus. So he's saying, I worked with my hands and I provided for myself. Remember, he says to what, some of the believers who are not working, he, uh, I think it's the, in the book of uh, Thessalonians, he says, if they're not working, get them out of the church. They've got to be working. They've got to work and provide. Right? But as an apostle, he, he could have said, hey, I'm going on these missionary journeys, uh, journeys. I'm not able to work, so uh, you have to provide for me so that I can you know, reach different places. And, uh, but he does not use that. Right? He does not use that option. He continues to work as a tent maker. Three, he chose not to ask for material things in support while he ministered. Now, as an apostle, he could have, you know, said, I need this, I need some clothes, I need some money to take the ship to go into this place, or I need to stay in Ephesus for three years, or I need to go to this city, and these are the people here. He does not ask at all, right? Uh, the church in, I think the church in Philippi that sent him some gifts, in terms of clothing, in terms of uh, finances. But well, what does he say? It's a sweet smelling aroma, but yet he's careful and he says, This is what God has put in your heart and you have given. So it's a sweet smelling aroma unto God. May the Lord bless you for doing it. Right? He does not uh, tell them, No, no, I don't want to return it back. He doesn't do all that. But he see, you see how well Paul handle himself as a as an apostle right and serving god this is very important for each one of us serving god is about serving people to see their lives transformed now it is not about okay i don't have to work a nine to five job i don't like the it company you know, but I like to, you know, uh, just be in the church the whole day, or I like to go out on ministry, uh, or, you know, uh, I, I like when people uh, ask me to pray. Uh, these are all the wrong reasons of serving God. Paul says, serving God is about serving people. And when we serve people, it is about seeing their lives transformed. Right? And when you look at the church around us, I think we have lost this in many places because now sometimes we look at, okay, ministry as a way of gaining wealth, as a way of, you know, just becoming famous or so that people may look at us and say, oh, he's a wonderful man uh, or, or, you know, he to become popular, to have a good reputation. Paul does not even care about all of that. Right, he's saying, "Look at my the fruit of my work." Right, the fruit of my work is not that I chose myself. Okay, I have nothing to do, so let me go and do ministry. No, he says, "God chose me," and so I've gone out. I've started these churches. I've started the ministry, and you are the fruit. Look at the results. Look at your lives being changed. Right now, he's saying this not so that he, he becomes popular or have a, has a good reputation. He's saying, serving God requires sacrifice. Right? It requires sacrifice. We willingly choose to sacrifice. 
willingly let go of things that we can legitimately enjoy but the question is are we willing to do this right now for example god has said to and maybe some of us i want you to start your own ministry or you're already pastors leading a church you have certain you know things that you can legitimately enjoy but why is it that we have to do 15 days fast 20 days fast, 21 days fast 40 days fasting why is it that we have to wake up early in the mornings and you know, everyone are resting but we have to you know wake up and pray and see God everyone are you know going out and enjoying themselves but we are you know not doing much of that but most of our time we are spending visiting people praying for people why are we doing all this is it so that we become famous no paul is saying i have the right even now if i stop the ministry if i go back to tent making right and i'm an old man now so paul is could also say i'm old i've done one missionary journey i think that should do I can go back work and then even if I die now, I know I'll go to heaven because I have received salvation. But Paul doesn't say that. He says, I have to serve God. It's a sacrifice. I will continue to sacrifice. Now remember, by this time, the Apostle Paul has been bruised physically. He's been beaten with rods. He's been thrown from a cliff. He's been you know, uh, 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 beaten with... Uh, uh, the lashes have he has received the Jewish lashes. He is he has been spit at, he's been mocked. Now, why should he go through all this at such an old age? Right? Probably right now he's about somewhere in his late 50s, early 60s. Why should he go through shipwreck and without food, without water, without you know, why is he doing all this? He's saying because he chose willingly to sacrifice. I can go home to Tarsus and just relax there. Just do the ministry in Tarsus. He says no. Right. So Paul is saying there is a necessity and a stewardship in serving God. But there's a great sense of responsibility to God and his people. There's a great sense of accountability. Right. So serving God is responsibility and accountability. If we have a church, and for example, if there are 10 people in the church, for those 10 people also, we must, you know, take it a great responsibility when we're ministering the word to them. It's a huge responsibility. And we must be accountable, right, to God with the gifts and the resources that He has given us. So sometimes we only look for the big. Right. Once my church becomes 500 or 1,000 people, then you see I'm going to pray for five hours, six hours a day. For now, one hour is enough. No, it should be the other way around. Because once your church grows 500, 600, you will not have time because you'll be busy. People will keep calling you. You'll have things to do in the church. So when you're starting small, start off with this great sense of responsibility to God. It's a responsibility to his people being accountable to God and accountable to his people. And you will see the fruit of your work. You will see the fruit that you know God will bring many lives. And uh, it's wonderful. The, I think the most joyful thing that a servant of God or a minister of God can see is a person who was living in sin, his life changed and transformed, and living uh, you know, in holiness, living uh, in, in Christ. That is the greatest joy as a minister of God. Right? So serving God is serving people by willingly entering into their world. Right? So he says here, verse 20, And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win the Jews. To those who are under the law, I became under the law so that I may win those who are under the law. To those who are without the law, as without the law, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without the law. To the weak I became weak, to the might that I might win the weak, 
I have become all things to all men that I might be able to save some. Now I do this for the sake of the gospel so that I may be a partaker of it with you. You see the Apostle Paul, you see his humility here, he's saying so that I can be a partaker with you. He doesn't say so that you can be a partaker with me. Right? It's so beautiful. He's saying to the Jews, I, I'll become a Jew. Right? If the Jew says, you know, I, I don't believe that he is the Messiah, so I'll become a Jew for them. I'll I'll try to, you know, answer them as uh, from a Jewish point of view. If there's somebody who's not under who's not under the law, maybe a Gentile, I'll become one just so that I can see them become a believer in Christ. To the weak, I'm not going to look down on the weak and say, okay, you don't know this, you don't know how to uh, pray, you don't know about the gifts of the Spirit. No. To the weak, I'll become weak. Uh, to the poor, I'll become poor. To the to the intellectual, I'll be the intellectual. Now you don't see Paul coming to a place of oh, these are very intellectual people. But to the weak, I'll be weak. No. To Galatians, he was very humble, very simple. He brought the gospel to them. He came in weakness and meekness. But when he went to Greece, when he went to Corinth in a second missionary journey, we don't see any meekness there. You know, they were all intellectuals. They had different kinds of understanding. But you see a boldness. You see that he was, you know, he preached the gospel in boldness there. Right? So he became what others were so that he can win them to Christ. Right? Now, stepping into others life or people's world may not be comfortable there may be risks involved there may be social ta taboos to break past it may require us to stretch our time our efforts our resources and here's the thing are we willing to do it for the gospel's sake so for example you know, maybe some of them put it there some somebody in your church or in your life group it may just come up to you see to you and say hey no, I've been feeling these thoughts of depression. Now, what must we do? We can't say depression. Why do you have depression? You're a believer. No, you should not have depression. Go back and pray and God will help you. We can't do that. I need to step into their world. I need to understand why this person is going through this. And the same thing with suicidal tendencies, with anxiety, with fear. Uh, fear of finances, fear of the future. You know, I, I know a couple of young youth who are, you know, all of a sudden there's some fear that gripped them. They're saying, What is our future? What are we going to be? And there's a fear. So everything they try to do, there's a fear. There's no freedom. Will this work in my life? What if I'm not able to get a job? What if I'm not? And they're in their early 20s. Right now, I can't say, hey, grow up, don't be like this, go to college, finish. I can't say that, right? I need to sympathize, I need to empathize, I need to get into their world. Because they are looking at the world in a different way. Now, as a believer, I may look into the world and say, God, you know, the enemy may come in uh, one way, but he will run in seven different ways. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise a standard against it. So as a believer, I'm... I'm using these verses and I'm you know, continuing to fight this fight uh, of faith. But maybe this person is not a believer or even he is a believer, but he's a little weak. Right? He still has to grow. I, not, I should not come to a place of bringing condemnation. But I should say, God, help me to get into his, you know, his shoes and see what he's going through. And Paul is saying, as an apostle, I know what you are going through. I've seen the threats that come from every side and I feel it, I know it. And, and, and he's trying to say that I can get into your world, your, your challenges, but I'll do it for the sake of the gospel. Right? Then he goes on. Verse 24. Right? Do you not know that those who run in a race all run but one receives the prize. 
run in such a way that you may obtain it now he's moving the attention to himself from himself and he's saying all of us have this responsibility right run in such a way that you may obtain it and everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things now they do it to obtain a perishable crown but we are for an imperishable crown therefore I, therefore i run this not with uncertainty thus i fight not as one who beats the air but i discipline my body and bring it into subjection lest when i have preached to others i myself should become disqualified now this verse is really strong the apostle is saying now as an apostle or as a leader nobody may question us so we must be self-governed as leaders serving god requires self-discipline self-governing empowered by the holy spirit we must watch over our lives and serve the lord so for example okay you feel that god is calling you to become a pastor or a you know a pastor for example right you started your church you're serving god the church is growing now as a leader nobody's going to come and question you right did you pray did you read your word? Did you spend time in God's presence? Nobody's going to question you. And very unlikely. Right? Because they look at you as a leader. Okay, this man is a pastor or he's an apostle. He's a leader in the church. So nobody will question, did you pray? Did you fast? Did you uh, spend time in God's word? Are you staying fresh in the word of God? Are you receiving revelation from God? Are you spending time with family? Are you looking after your finances? Are you faithful to the resources that God has given you? Nobody's going to question. So Paul is saying, if I keep preaching that you should do these things, and if I myself don't do it, I will be disqualified. Right. So picture this. Imagine this, right? As a as a leader or a pastor, we keep saying, telling people, okay, you read the word, you pray, and you should must fast. You should use God's word as a weapon. We're doing all this. We're preaching it Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. We're serving God's people, but it's come a time when the more of serving personally, I myself am not growing. I'm just come to a place where I'm just pouring out, but I'm not receiving anything. So Paul is saying, now if that's the case, I myself will be disqualified from what I've been preaching. Right? So as believers, as as leaders in the church, as pastors, and uh, you know anything in the fivefold ministry, we must be accountable. We must have self-discipline. We must be self-governing. Be able to spend time in prayer, spend time in God's word, reading, right, gaining knowledge. All of this is important, right? And how do we do it? We are empowered by the Holy Spirit. So we must watch over our own lives, right? So some of the key lessons in this chapter. One, serving God is about serving people to see their lives transform and i i urge each of you let this be the motto of why we do ministry it's got very little to do with you know all the other things when we serve god to serve people to see their lives transformed if that's the main aim all the other things under that will come in alignment to this vision right if i'm serving god and uh, uh, and i'm serving people just so that i can come on youtube or so that people can watch me and uh, you know all of these things then the reason is wrong because paul is saying you serve god serving god is serving people to see their lives transformed serving god requires sacrifice could be sacrifice of our time our resources, our sleep, right? 
There'll be times you won't feel like reading the word. There'll be times you don't feel like fasting and praying. There'll be times you don't feel like, you know, counseling this person. You're just tired. But it involves sacrifice. Serving God is stewardship. There's a responsibility. There's accountability. You say, God, thank you for the responsibility you've given me. Help me to be accountable in what I'm doing. And then serving God is serving people by willingly entering their world. That's saying, to the Jew, I'll become a Jew. To the Gentile, I'll become a Gentile. Right? And, and to the weak, I'll become weak. To the intellectual, I will be an intellectual. Right? Just so that I can bring them to Christ. And finally, serving God requires a self-governing ability. I cannot be a person who keeps teaching, keeps you know preaching and doing all of this. And then in the end, I myself am disqualified from the prize. Right? So we must keep a close eye, close watch on our lives. Many a times, you know, many leaders that we see around us, why are they falling? Why are they falling into temptation and sin and living a sinful life? They're in ministry, full-time ministry, 10 years, 20 years. Why is it happening? The reason is they're so caught up with serving people, serving people. They've forgotten that they need to go back to God. It's only once you keep we keep getting that fresh revelation is when we can give it to others. right? Otherwise, it's just... It's going to be in a way that you know one day we will fall because we have not spent time in prayer and God's word, right? So interesting, very interesting chapter. Paul has, you know, uh, defended the gospel, uh, and he's put out his own reasons as to why he's not, uh, you know, using his rights as an apostle, right? Uh, so any questions? Any questions before we go into chapter ten? Any questions? Okay, Mangi has questions. What right do an apostle have? Sorry, Mangi, I, I saw you uh, because I was projecting. I couldn't see the chat. Okay, so Mangi asks, what right do an apostle have? Now, uh, if you look at the old, uh, the New Testament, Paul is saying he had the right, one, to be married to a believing wife, right? So he could, he can be married. Two, he had the right to come to a place of saying, hey, I'm doing this ministry. Can you provide for the, for the, for the ministry? He had the right to ask, right? Uh, you you give, uh, give for my personal needs as well because I'm going to these kind of places. So I need uh, this help, right? So, uh, and we also see in the other, uh, he gives us reasons there in chapter 9. Uh, I think it's three odd reasons. Yeah. He chose not to have a believing wife. He chose not to stop working. So as a minister of God, he could have kept saying, you know, I'm doing ministry, so you provide for me. But he chose not to do that. And then three, he chose not to ask for material things. Right Now, we do understand that you know, many of the places that Paul went were, he went by ship or he went uh, uh, by walk and by road and uh, and so there were needs, right? He would have needed material things as well. And uh, he never asked for them. Though as an apostle, he had the right to ask. So when you translate that into the times that we're living in now, Maggie, as, as ministers of God, sometimes, and we, I'm, I'm sure we've seen this around, no? people say, provide for you provide and only then we can buy this. You give and only then we can buy this. Right, so that is a wrong way to ask for you know giving unto God must be given right. We we do tell them right, uh, give as the Lord leads you. God loves a cheerful giver, but we never say only if you give we can do this. Only if you give uh, materially then we can do this as a church. Only if you do this, no. Right, so basically what Paul is saying is you all are there. Believers as a church, my, my my resources, my help comes from God. God will provide for my needs, right? Uh, so that's what Paul is, uh, you know, focusing on. He's saying, I can ask for all this. I don't want to ask. I want to do it on my own. And even if I, when I'm doing it on my own, I know that God will provide 
whatever I need. Right? But then he says, why is Paul quoting the law to a Gentile church? Why should the church provide for their pastor? Okay, so Paul is now this church, we must understand the church in Corinth is is not it's a Gentile church, but they have Jews also. Right? Oh, there are people who are Jews, right? Remember, there was the persecution that happened, and so the Jews went all across into Asia Minor, right? So if you look at Galatia also. Galatia is again, it is a Gentile uh, uh, place, but he says to them, "No, why are you going back to the law? Why are you going back to circumcision?" So after the Roman persecution, the Jews went into different places, right? And so when they went into these different places, they settled in those places, right? So there were predominantly it was a Gentile church. Yet there were Jews who became believers and came into the church. Right. So Mangi, I hope that answers your question. Uh, yes, Pata. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so so if you, even if you look at the church in Jerusalem, there were uh, 10,000 odd people uh, in, in the church. Now, all of them were not Jews, right? but it was predominantly a Jewish church. Like they were all Jews. Uh, but there were Gentiles, there were people from other faiths as well. So it was a mixed crowd. Um, so Paul is, you know, quoting to them as well. So why should the church provide for their pastor? Right. So during uh, those times, right, when you look at the Old Testament, uh, God gave certain rules or certain, uh, um, you know, uh, functions to leaders. So if you look at the Old Testament, the high priests and the priests, what they had to do was they had to only sit and, you know, read from God's word, prepare themselves, be able to, you know, do the sacrifices. And they were, they had the authority or they had the right to use what, you know, portions of the offering, portions of the, um, the sacrifices for their own personal need, right? God uh, uh, allowed it because they are always doing this. They are not, they've dedicated themselves to God. Now, over time, what has happened is it became a norm. You have to give. Right? Because God told uh, in the Old Testament, right? God told Moses and the people of Israel, you have to provide for the, you have to be there for your high priest as a, uh, and they, they have the right to uh, use portions of the sacrifice. Because they're called of God, right? So that that right, that feeling of okay, I it's my right to have it continued on and on and on. So when it came to the time of the New Testament, that same picture was still going on, and I think I believe that we must provide to the church, right? God has said, "Give unto the Lord," so that is good. But out of our own, if we feel led. To provide to a leader or a pastor, we can do that, right? There's nothing wrong. And when we do that, we're doing it in, in a way that is pleasing to God, right? Uh, so it's not that the church has to provide. If you don't provide, you know, you'll, uh, you have not obeyed the, uh, you know, God is not pleased with you. No, right? You give unto the church, right? And as, uh, uh, and as a pastor, if you're in the, if you're a salaried in the church you will get your portion and uh, you know that's your income for the month uh, but here's the important thing we must provide we must give unto the lord when we give even if you're giving it to a believer in the church you know the lord jesus says it so wonderfully he says let not your right hand know left hand know what your right hand is doing right meaning do it in a quiet way because the Lord will see your reward and bless you. So it's good to provide for fellow believers, for leaders, uh, for your pastors in the church. But it should not be out of compulsion or force. Right? A pastor or a leader cannot say you have to give. Right? You have to give to me, then only you'll be blessed. That will be completely wrong. Right? It's God said you give to the church, give to his kingdom. And then, uh, as as a believer, we choose to bless others. It's going to be a blessing to us as well. 
right? Uh, so we'll take a break. We'll come back in 10 minutes, 10 o'clock, and we'll start with chapter 10. Thank you.